He's coming out on the Saturday afternoon. Uh, no, he's been asked to sit oh, there because people are filming. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> all right. He has started off here. Right. All right. All right. Um, I thought I might start with a, a brief Australian story about the former Australian Prime Minister who, uh, whenever he was uh, under threat, if there was a, a crisis that he had to deal with, his response always was, and he had a very deep voice, very sonorous voice. His name was Gough Whitlam. Some of you may remember that he was ultimately sacked as Prime Minister. But his default mechanism in a time of crisis was to bury the bastards in bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> and basically what Gough meant by that was not literally to bury them in, in pure bullshit, but to release so much information that people couldn't process it. The media couldn't process it. The public couldn't process it. Nobody could process it sufficiently to get on top of it all. But at the same time, at any point later, he could say, oh, we'll release that. And with, with the whole security debate now, the way events, the, the pace at which events are unfolding, it's, it's almost a similar concept that we have, that, that we're all being buried with bullshit. There is so much getting out. There is so much... You, you, for years we've complained about what we're not being told, but so much is happening and so much is being released these days that you don't know, and it's also being released into a 24-7 media environment. You don't know whether what you hear today is a, a slight twist or a slight variation of what you heard yesterday, or whether it's a news story, whether Gaza was being bombed today, or whether it was actually being bombed yesterday, but the person we told you today, or the news bulletin you heard today is only catching up on what was reported yesterday. So it's, there's this incredible confusion. Um, I mean, just look at recent events. Look at what Obama, the security system in the U.S. at the moment, which Obama inherited from the Bush administration, is now dealing with uh, Fort Hood, with the Christmas Day would-be bomber on the uh, flight into Detroit, and with the Al-Qaeda attack on Fob Chapman in Afghanistan. You know, it makes you think nothing has been learned since 9-11 in terms of these three very different... <coughs> Uh, incidents that show weaknesses, failings in the system that were supposed to have been built in the aftermath of 9-11, yet you have these three incredible events that show you the, uh, expose the weaknesses in the system. This week I was struck by the local media response to some of those events, and in particular the, uh, the Bob Chapman attack here on the CIA base in Afghanistan, where in the space of 24 hours I read it both in the New York Times and I listened to Anderson Cooper on CNN telling us that the, uh, the, the Al-Qaeda attack on Fob Chapman was, and they both used the same form of words, a wonderful window into the CIA's <laughs> pursuit of Al-Qaeda. No, it wasn't. It was a staggeringly wonderful window into Al-Qaeda's pursuit of the CIA. <laughs> and, and yet, they managed to turn this completely upside down. In the same vein, the same vein of things being reversed into something which they're not, or presented as something which the General Stanley Crystal's report on Afghanistan and uh, the report that led to the uh, Obama decision to increase troop numbers in Afghanistan because that's essentially all we heard about in the Crystal Report. All we heard about it in the aftermath of its leaking was a debate about troop numbers. And the most remarkable aspect of that report was, it was about 60 odd pages, but if you read it, what it amounted to was an argument for not sending troops. McChrystal's assessment, and given that it came from McChrystal, who had all the authority of such a senior American general analyzing events on the ground in Afghanistan, the, the assessment that he made of Afghanistan, just what, it, what he did not conclude, but what it said was, it's madness to send you. Certainly in the numbers he was asking for, and certainly in the numbers that Obama would whittle his request back to, to make it look as though he hadn't given him everything he'd asked for. Um, it's worth making some 
before I go into what McChrystal had to say, it's worth making a few observations about Afghanistan. Probably the most important one is that historically, change has never happened fast in Afghanistan. When, it's, when change has been successful, it's happened under a strong local leadership over a period of decades rather than months or years. Um, trying now to get the uh, Crystal Obama plan into place when we're already talking about pulling out in July uh, 2011 uh, is quite bizarre in terms of what the history of the country tells you. Uh, the Russians couldn't do it, the British couldn't do it, nobody had been able to do it, and to try doing it all again. And, uh, you have to keep coming back to the, the media treatment of these things uh, these days because every war now is a media war, whether you like it or not. Trying to do it. Um, it's worth noting that 80% of the aid that's going into Afghanistan now goes into projects that bypass the Afghan government. So we're trying to create a central government that has the power and authority to run the country, but Every day we're flashing a message to the Afghan people, we don't trust your government. And rightly so, given how corrupt it is. But you, there's a, it's like a donut, there's a, hole, there's a hole in the center, which is the government that you're trying to support, which nobody will trust with, a, with, a, with an aid dollar. Um, all the reports, of the reports that attend to the, uh, the McChrystal report and its implementation by Obama, uh, we continually were told that we're going to triple the civilian uh, experts working in Afghanistan. And that sounds great. We're going to increase them three times. But still only going to put 1,000 people in there. There still will only be 1,000 civilian experts working in a country that's bigger than Iraq, more populous than Iraq, more difficult than Iraq, geographically almost impossible by comparison with Iraq, virtually no roads are worth mentioning, um, it's, so a thousand, and the ability of those thousand to move around in a country like Afghanistan at the moment will be virtually zero. They'll live in bunkers in capital, in capital and provincial centres. Um, a few months ago, I was asked to give a speech in uh, in Australia at a conference on uh, on the future of Afghanistan. And I was asked expressly to address the strength of the insurgency in Afghanistan. And I thought that my, as a starting point, I would do what I think a lot of people haven't done, and you can put your hands up in a minute if you like, and I'll ask you the question. I hadn't sat down to read McChrystal in its entirety. Has anybody here done that? <laughs> I, I, I'm a working, journal, working journalist in Afghanistan, and I hadn't done it. Everything I'd read had been presses, surmises, uh, bullet pointed pre uh, representations, uh, repackaging of. So, in sitting down to assess the strength of the insurgency, I started by reading McChrystal's document. And I didn't have to go any further. Because, in a sense, it didn't matter what the insurgency had going for it in terms of numbers, in terms of funding, in terms of uh, weapons. The greater strength the insurgency has going for it is the Western effort. <laughs> <laughs> Think about it. Everything that the West is doing it is handling so badly that it plays, it plays to the uh, insurgency the whole time. Um, and, and again, you know, given that, uh, that the McChrystal document is articulated with the authority of such a senior American, it, it makes it a truly damning document. Um, it's timing. If you look at the timing of the McChrystal Report in the context of the American occupation of Afghanistan with the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan, it's almost identical to a document which is written by a, uh, a Russian general by the name of Taskalov, in, uh, who uh, his document was dated August 17, but it was August 17, 1987. And he, uh, going through, he was briefing a new minister, a new defense minister in Moscow, and he called for an honest admission of failure after eight years. He cited the squandering of huge material resources and considerable casualties 
and a failure to stabilize the country at all, militarily and politically. 